Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. My name is Lynn Huynh, uh, and I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Gladstone. I'll be the moderator for today's event, which is presented as part of our Critical Conversation series. Critical Conversation started almost three years ago as a way to bring together Gladstone's community around important issues and expose Gladstonians to new topics that may not traditionally be addressed within the walls of our organization. Discussions like the one today are meant to encourage you to reframe or shift your perspective, and we hope that you continue this dialogue outside of our forum. When we launched Gladstone's first DEI strategy in 2021, we outlined many tactics to improve uh, gender and racial equity and diversity, but we knew that our strategy didn't adequately address one important population, individuals with intellectual and learning disabilities, often called neurodivergent, and those with developmental disabilities. Most organizations are committed to increasing the diversity of their employees, but did you know that only 12% of companies hire individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities? And as a result, 85% of differently abled adults remain unemployed. So for Autism Awareness Month this April, I'm so happy that we have really three amazing panelists with us to help uncover some of these myths and help us learn more about the benefits of hiring differently abled individuals. They'll also share with us some tips for improving the recruitment of people with disabilities. Before we get to the panel discussion, we'll be taking time with each of our panelists individually. First, we'll hear from the co-founder of Creative Spirit, which is the first global nonprofit talent acquisition organization devoted to placing candidates with disabilities in fair wage positions at the best companies in the world. She'll give us an inside look at a study that set out to determine attitudes, behaviors, and barriers to hiring individuals with disabilities. Then we'll chat with an employer who worked with Creative Spirit and learn about the impact that hiring differently abled individuals had on her company. And finally, we'll hear directly from a Creative Spirit ambassador who is herself a neurodivergent person and can tell us firsthand about her experience. And at the end, we're gonna have some questions, so be sure to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A as we go. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first panelist today is Laura Rossi, Chief Partnerships Officer at Omnicom. Previously, she has been an advisor to a wide range of global brands, including Verizon, City, and Revlon, and held the role of Chief Marketing Officer at OMD Worldwide and Organic. Perhaps most relevant for today's event, Laura is also a co-founder of Creative Spirit, as well as executive chair and trustee. She works tirelessly to realize the mission of connecting candidates with fair wage positions where they can be fully appreciated, accepted, and empowered to succeed. Laura, we're so happy to have you with us today. Um, we'll start with a few questions to get to know you. Can you first tell us why you started Creative Spirit? Sure. Well, thank you for having us and very excited to be here and to be a part of your community. Uh, started Creative Spirit um, in 2017 after having a number of conversations with industry and business colleagues. And we talked a lot about the fact that we were just not seeing people with disabilities in the workplace. I also, on a personal level, have a daughter with an intellectual disability, and she was quite young at the time, but it made me really think about how incredibly difficult it was going to be for her to navigate the world without opportunity being created for her. And so Creative Spirit was started on the strength of the experience of a colleague of mine in Australia who said he had hired one individual with Down syndrome, which completely changed the culture of the company. Yeah, thank you so much, both a deeply personal um, uh, reason, and thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so we know that Creative Spirit is on a mission to place 1 million neurodivergent individuals in fair wage jobs in this decade. Can you tell us why that is so important? I think that when we look around and we see the representation, um, just not just in the workplace, but um, in society at large, in places that we typically tread, we don't see the belonging that we're hoping for, for people in some of the more protected classes and populations. And people with disabilities in particular, who probably need a little more help than most to navigate the world, um, really need advocacy to be able to make that happen. And so in the spirit of belonging, you know, I really believe that creative spirit um, needs to do this in mass and we need to be able to see um, 
folks with disability represented in media, marketing, advertising, a business that I, I know well, and Andrea and even Joanna know super well. Um, we're working with other colleagues um, in these industries also to make sure that representation um, abounds. And I, they just announced the uh, Mattel uh, doll with Down syndrome this week. So that was very mm -hmm. exciting to see because yeah. little girls and little boys mm -hmm. um, have the opportunity to see someone like themselves in normal play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And can you, um, for those who are not familiar with Creative Spirit, can you explain in a few sentences what Creative Spirit does, what services or support that you all provide to uh, not only candidates, but also employers? Yes, of course. So in a quest to really have a million jobs, um, if you think about it, um, right now there's 85% unemployment. And so we really started to unravel. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to our study. Um, we started to unravel, you know, the reasons why. Um, we know that employment is incredibly important because it makes you productive. It also keeps you out of poverty. Um, and it also means that there's some independence in your life. And so um, when we started to build the services, we wanted to build the services in three ways. One is to support the community you know, teaching skills, training our candidates. Um, the second is what we learned very quickly was what, that we had to offer training to the corporation. So we do that at Creative Spirit. Um, and we bring in the coaches that help candidates be successful over the long run. We're very proud of our retention rate. Um, and then the third thing that we do is we raise awareness in the community. And that is by creating events and having um uh, awareness uh, opportunities like these to make creative spirit more well-known in the community. Yeah, thank you. It sounds like a really sort of multi-pronged approach to um, not only supporting candidates, but also working with employers and organizations to shift the culture um, and also just continuing to being ambassadors of, um, and promoting the importance of, of uh, this issue. Without a doubt. Um, yeah. And I know that you mentioned the study, Laura, that in December 2020, Creative Spirit finalized the study to gain empirical data um, around hiring and creating and retaining employees with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that the goal of this um, study was to use its information to build a roadmap to more desirable GI practices. So I wanted to invite you to share with us an overview of what you found in that study. Yeah, I will, um, I will share it and we will be able to drop in the uh, chat a link to the actual study itself so um, folks can Perfect. take advantage of that as well. I'll skip through some of the some of the slides um, in the interest of staying on time, but um, you'll see the study is actually a separate document that we're very happy to share with your um, folks. So you've already met um, Andrea and Joanna, and I think we'll hear more from them. But um, and you heard a little bit about the history of the organization. Um, I think the DEI conversation, you know, from our founding is something that we feel like we've gotten on the table. And I just wanted to add that as we move through um, the study, you'll learn that we've also created not only full-time jobs, but internships and fellowships as well. Um, one of the things that, you know, we wanted to do when we started out um, was to think about the context of what's already been done, right? You think about ADA, you think about, you know, 30 plus years ago that um, ADA was launched and, uh, you would think that in equal employment and infrastructure in the world was existing. And what we've come to find out um, almost 32 years later now is that a lot of the infrastructure um, pieces have been put in place. As an example, I live in New York City and I hear on the subway all the time um, an announcement about that there happens to be an elevator in this station. And that kind of infrastructure was took 30 years to build, by the way, because that's how long the legislation allowed, um, ironically. But um, I feel like the infrastructure has happened, but the sort of soulful move to get to employment and talk to companies um, about you know, putting this kind of parameter in place hasn't really happened. And so that was really the, the start of the study. And that higher different study, you know, suggested that only 12% of companies include disability in their DEI efforts. And so one of the things that, um, you know, it helped us do was to focus on the talent recruitment and pipeline, obviously the training, awareness and education, and then the corporate ally and general support that I talked about earlier. Um, one of the things that before I launch into some of the details of the study that you'll see is that 
you know, there are some tenets that are just so, so important. This right to real jobs for fair wages is one of the tenets that we went in trying to understand. Um, in fact, uh, disability is the only um, community that can be paid uh, still in this country uh, sub-minimum wage. And so we've had candidates come to us and say, um, I got my paycheck from my employer and it was 20 cents this week. And it's sort of astounding. And you think, what? But um, there is, it is legal in this country to pay sub-minimum wage. And it's not that they're just being paid sub-minimum wage. It's also that the organizations that are putting this together are treating it as a charity, right? I'm, I'm putting this workplace in place. I take my costs out of it. And then what's left over is given to the employees. And we just feel like that's the wrong attitude toward um, disability employees, for sure. Full DEI integration was what we were trying to understand as we walked into the study. Um, how do we um, look at recruitment in such a way that we make it easy for employers? You know, what are the obstacles? And then what is the consumer or end user um, attitude that needs to happen? And what are the things that need to be put in place to make it work? And so here's a summary of the learnings and some of them, um, won't surprise you, but some of them sort of surprised us along the way. And, you know, if you think about when we launched the study at the end of 2020, and we've since benchmarked and the findings have been um, consistent through 2022, that hiring is still very active, even in spite of, you know, macroeconomic headwinds, and that diversity goals are commonplace. Diversity hiring right now is continues to be dominated by race and gender, which is amazing. And um, something I want to talk about in terms of where we go next is intersectionality. Um, but disability hiring is at the bottom of the priority list. The primary reasons for not hiring those with disabilities happen to be surrounded in myth. And so what's good about that is, right, you can dispel a myth. You can, you can make something true. Um, and make people understand with enough education and enough, you know, money to be able to educate a population about myths. And those are that there's a lack of a pipeline. There's a perception of a lack of ability to meet the demands of fair wage employment among candidates. And so um, that leads you to, you know, think, well, what about training? What about, you know, resources available to HR teams? And then the amount of support it will take to support people with disabilities. C-level executives and managers are divided in their view of the tools and resources that are available to manage diversity hires. And so I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there is a universal interest in an organization like Creative Spirit or a Creative Spirit once they're exposed to the concept. So we know that education, we know that making it easier is something that um, leads to success in the long run. And obviously we've had a fair amount of success that we're super proud of that has helped us along the way. See if I can advance my slide here. There we go. So as I mentioned before, we know that hiring right now and certainly through the pandemic was still very active. And if you remember, you know, there was sort of a hunt for great talent going on at that time. And while that slowed down a little, actually unemployment is not... Um, really very much different than it was a couple of years ago. So you know that the marketplace is not um, is ripe for hiring people with disabilities, among others. Um, we know that um, despite a competitive hiring marketplace, that those interview that those interviewed have a high level of success um, in terms of being hired into their target professions. Mm -hmm. um, and we also know that again, that targeting that the diversity and inclusion trends are are continuing to hold, right? Whether you're a 2,500 plus employer, a large employer or a small employer, that um, there's no less interest in diversity hires. Although one thing, you know, concerns me in this marketplace, and that is, are the DEI leads, you know, going to lose their jobs in a less favorable macroeconomic environment? And that's something we've been doing to support the employers. Um, about half of companies with DEI initiatives are fully executing against their mission. And so that's where we learned that you know, while, you know, we're so disability focused in general, we know that hiring um, people with diverse interests from different backgrounds is not the easiest hiring situation because despite the fact that there's so much more focus on it, that employers have not given their HR departments enough funding, enough manpower, and enough training to make it happen. And that is not peculiar to disability, by the way, that is, you know, across the board. 
There is ubiquitous familiarity with IDDs or intellectual and developmental disabilities as a segment of the diversity talent pool. So it's not like people say, oh my God, I didn't know anything about you know that. Um, I'm very familiar with um, people with disabilities. However, hiring individuals with disabilities, as I mentioned earlier, ranks very close to the bottom mm -hmm. of the equation, um, uh, followed only by um, Asian employees, which I believe um, is something that has only slightly improved the same way disability has only had slightly improved over the past three years. Barriers to hiring those with intellectual disabilities um, include a lack of a belief that there's a lack of a pipeline. So, you know, an organization like Creative Spirit, where we actually introduce you to the candidates, um, we have an online tool where we can match the candidates with the best jobs um, for them and vice versa, you know, the best talent for the best jobs um, exists. And there's just little awareness of these kinds of tools in the marketplace. Education awareness of um, the profound unemployment of people with disabilities is about 50%. And so having awareness of the problem of the 85% unemployment rate, something we've been focusing on a lot because we learned that a lot of the decision makers just didn't really have um, a sense of that. And then those with IDDs do not um, have the intellectual capacity to earn and keep fair wage positions or it's not a priority for them is a very pervasive attitude. And that is the myth busting we find to be the easiest to do once you get to hear from some of our candidates. And you'll hear from Joanna as an example, who you know, will blow you away with not only her capability and intellect, but also her capacity you know, to be as persistent as the next person, probably more in some ways um, in terms of holding a fair wage position. Um, we also know that companies need a lot of supports to employ those with IDDs and they're not prepared. Um, that is actually one of our myths and one of our barriers. Um, one of the reasons that we put such an extensive training program in place for employers is because we know that um, the amount of training and the accommodations that actually get put in place for people with IDDs either costs less than $500 or close to zero in most cases, if you're looking at um, the median. Um, and they're simple, you know, I need a break every two hours. I need to, um, you know, have my instructions written down, et cetera. And we find that not, you know, certainly not minimizing it, but I, I do feel like the accommodations that most people with disabilities that we place need um, are very common and are available and are available by law, but are, should also be available to everybody. And so ultimately, we expose the creative spirit concept to the talent acquisition leaders and SVPs and above, as an example, decision makers. And we, um, the good news is that hiring professionals clearly understood that there were resources out there like a creative spirit to help facilitate this hiring process. And that um, not only did they comprehend it, but it completely changed their attitude toward the barriers that we were trying to address. So that was a long way around of saying um, this, you know, near ubiquitous interest means that supporting an organization like Creative Spirit and helping us get the message out there in any capacity um, is super important to our success and our collective success in the marketplace. The last thing I'll say is that. Um, without um, running through you know, all the details, I would say that the intersectionality topic is a very important one to us. And one of the studies that we did along with um, Verizon, one of our partners, was to really understand what happens when you start to you know, cross some of the protected classes that we've been talking about. And I, I will just say anecdotally and, and statistically, if I were a black woman with a disability, my chances of being hired are statistically close to zero. So this is um, not a matter of choosing, you know, one group over another to be able to support. This is a matter of supporting everybody. And um, there's you. always... Yeah. Some some missions that are important. There are some times during the year that are important to our mission. So I just put that up there. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing this data, Laurel. Uh, we have so much to come back to during our panel discussion. Um, but before we get to that, um, I'd like to introduce today's second panelist, Andrea Sullivan. Andrea Sullivan is the Chief Marketing Officer at VaynerX, a full service marketing agency. In addition to her passion, integrity, and outstanding support of inclusion, empathy and employment for neurodiverse individuals. Andrea is an expert in glowing, 
Growing Global Brands. Andrea hosts an online series, Marketing for the Now, where she has conversations each month with C-suite celebrities and culture shapers. She was previously the Global Chief Marketing Officer at Interbrand. Andrea is a proud board member of Creative Spirit, Ad Council, the Miami Ad School, and the United Nations Association of New York. She's also a professor at the Master's in Branding Program at the School of Visual Arts. Andrea, thank you so much for um, taking time to be here today. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for including us on such an important conversation. We appreciate all of you that are taking time out of your day to join us. Yeah, absolutely. Can you start by telling us how and um, how and why you started working with Creative Spirit? Absolutely. So I think, you know, some of what uh, Laurel just shared to me is still shocking that in today's world, we could have a population that has 85% unemployment. Uh, I think we went over some of the numbers uh, fairly quickly, but for me to meet some of the candidates that then became employed by some of our partners and to hear their stories, um, beautiful stories, talented people that had so much to give, and yet they were, you know, a forgotten, um, you know, population in for major corporations that seem that talk the talk about their ambitions to be hiring more diverse um, talent across the board. And yet there's only 12% of major corporations that are even focused on this topic at all. So I, I really, um, after talking to some of the, the candidates and really feeling um, almost desperate uh, to be able to help in telling the story, um, you know, I decided to join, join the board. Um, and to help in celebrating how we could scale the the impressive um, solution that Creative Spirit really delivers to um, to major corporations and small ones as well. Yeah, yeah. And can you tell us what the impact has been um, of hiring individuals with disabilities at VaynerX? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, we haven't really touched on is the degree to which a commitment to hiring uh, those that perhaps um, suffer with IDDs, the impact on the on the culture overall. So I think what we found across the board uh, for our partners is, um, you know, a commitment to training and to bringing candidates on board breeds a culture of empathy. Um, and and there, there's a reciprocity in terms of joy that's really celebrated from all of the interactions that we see, um, particularly because we take a lot of time and effort in making sure that the placements are right, that we're educating the corporations and creating environments where our candidates can thrive, but equally the uh, companies themselves can experience tremendous business results. One of the things that came out of the, the study um, that we, we didn't touch on a whole lot uh, was a point that uh, Accenture had contributed in terms of those companies that do hire neurodiverse candidates do experience greater business results. And I think a lot of it does have to do with the fact that the cultures are stronger, that people are prouder uh, for where they work. Um, but equally, we're able to find those those appropriate matches so people can double down on their secret superpowers and their talents and be able to really invest them um, in ways that help help everybody thrive. Yeah, yeah, I definitely hear that. Thank you so much. I think the um, other thing I would mention, yeah, um, not to, not to cut you off there, is is just I think there's a misunderstanding in terms of how difficult it is to to bring on um, you know differently abled candidates, um, and so I think part of it is an educational issue, and so we're certainly trying to spread the word, and so we thank all of you for joining and and you know spending time and hopefully spreading the stories that we're going to be sharing with you today. Uh, but I think the other thing is that, uh, you know, through a strong partnership, we can take all those friction points out and set up uh, that the appropriate amount of training so that everybody feels very confident about the relationships that we that we land. Um, and so we, we can make it, in fact, easy, an easy part of your diversity solution so that we're not strictly focused on race and gender, but we're going a little bit deeper in the DE&I uh, problem solving. Yeah really integrating it into the, the GI strategy as well as the culture is what I'm hearing. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, next up, we have our third panelist, um, Joanna. 
Joanna McElhinney is a self-advocate for her own experiences with intellectual and developmental disabilities, so spe specifically ADHD and dyslexia, and people with disabilities from all backgrounds. She works as a community manager for Creative Spirit and speaks as a disability advocate at corporate and industry events including Advertising Week New York and um, the Lions Festival of Creativity. Her team's day-to-day -day mission is to make creative spirit, digital communication, and media the best accessible and, and inclusive content for people with disabilities, as well as to help organizations and HR departments transition to inclusive hiring practices. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you for yeah. doing all these incredible introductions. Um, I'm just going to add on real quickly. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I am a identifying white individual with a black shirt, um, and I am very excited to be here and excited to meet all of you guys virtually. Um, Thank you so much. One of our one of our main pillars on our team at Creative Spirit and the communications department is trying to be at the front line of creating communication that is more accessible through our senses um, to many, many, many diverse different um, folks with disabilities, um, including both invisible and physical. Um, so I'm very grateful to be here to talk a little bit about that. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to share my story and for you guys creating a safe space for me to share my story. Um, it's not always easy. Um, not everyone wants to do this. So thank you guys for doing that. And um, I look forward to, to being as educational as possible. Yeah, thank you, Joanna. Can you start off by describing um, to us some of the struggles that you've uh, faced in the past when trying to find or keep a job? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the main conversations that is very interesting and very personal to each individual with a disability is the disclosure conversation. Um, and what I mean by that is, do I disclose my disability to my employer? Um, when do I disclose that disability to my employer? What if I choose not to disclose that disability to my employer? Um, and, and sort of there's a lot of variations of that, but those are probably the three main um, sort of pathways that, that I've experienced with myself and my peers. Um, I would say for me, I struggled knowing when to disclose, where to disclose, if it was professional to disclose, um, if I would be safe physically or and mentally, if I did disclose to my managers and employer, um, would my employment, employment be at risk? Financially, you know, would I have security if I disclosed? Um, would I face ridicule from my employers, uh, my peers, or um, personally? Um, and I think those questions are very fair. I think some of the other questions that folks have asked that are not necessarily part of my story, but that are also important to note are um, for some folks, if I retain a full fair wage employment, um, Will I maintain my health care benefits? Will I um, maintain my independence? Um, and 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 so on around that. Um, so this is a real discussion. It's it's definitely um, unique um, in everyone's sort of disability journey to employment. Um, and for me, I did both. <laughs> there were times I did not disclose and. The reason why I now disclose and why I am a disability advocate is because of my experiences not disclosing. Um, I will say that at the organization that I disclosed, everyone was really lovely and accepting and provided a really safe space. But I was young. I didn't know really the professional pathway to go about disclosing. Um, I didn't know the professional pathway to request accommodations, which you re I received in school, but um, there was no clear uh, there was a gap in how I could receive um, accommodations in the professional space. Um, like talked about in the interviews and all, it was never talked about in um, uh, with my managers ever. And um, I never worked with Creative Spirit at that time. So I had no education to be my own advocate. And um, I think, you know, once once that uh, I was ultimately let go from that job along with a hundred other people. Um, so no fault of my own, but what I will say is the mental, uh, 
endurance that you have to have when you don't disclose for me was a lot harder um, day to day than after I'd been disclosing for some time, been educated myself on what my needs were, and also worked with a bench of support from the creative spirit community, um, which educated me on what my accommodations could be and educated my managers um, on what their sort of rights were and to ask questions and and um, support me and, and so that we could all succeed as a team. Um, so that's a little bit of the disclosure journey for me. Um, there's certainly a lot of other things that can go into this conversation around mental health, productivity, um, uh, finding the right culture at a, at a company, because um, that took quite a bit of time for me as well. Um, but I will say without Creative Spirit Services, which I was originally part of our first cohort in 2018, um, without that experience, I would not be able to succeed as a as a productive employee today. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and that's a really nice segue to uh, us wanting to learn more about why and um, why did you choose to get involved with Creative Spirit as an ambassador? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say personally, it's it's both personal and professional. Um, I, from a professional standpoint, like I mentioned, I had never encountered other services that could bridge the gap of understanding coming out of uh, knowing I had a disability from within my education structure and traveling into um, a professional sphere and getting employment. Um, it was my ambassador, if you will, for that process. Um, and so it was really an honor when they asked me um, to share my experiences and to continue to be a support to my peers in whatever ways I could. Um, and it's provided an immense self of empower, um, immense amount of self empowerment that I really struggled with after my diagnosis, which was a very late diagnosis, which um, is very common for women with disabilities um, for a variety of reasons. Um, this was the community that I found my belonging in, and I just was honored to be that individual, and I continue to be to this day. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, at this time, I'd like to, um, now that we've gotten to know all, each of our panelists individually, I'd like to bring everyone all together for a discussion. Um, and we have some prepared questions, but before we actually get to that, there was a really um, nice, really thoughtful comment in the chat that i like to highlight um, regarding, and we want to ask our speakers, um, sort of if you can help define who you include in uh, the term IDD and whether that's talking about the protection and empowerment of people who may be in a vulnerable group, um, like people with Down syndrome, or whether it applies more broadly to people who are not vulnerable in the same way, but who have conditions or disabilities that may result in barriers in employment, like ADHD or learning disabilities. Yeah, I, yeah I'm happy to take like that to... one, sure. Perfect. Um, you know, I think that the opportunity is really across the board. We find that we have been as helpful to the Down syndrome community as somebody who has, I will describe as high functioning autism, uh, ADHD, et cetera. There really is, and we we don't only focus on um, IDD, meaning we started out that way because this is the population that really is the most vulnerable and unemployed physical disability, we have lots and lots of candidates with physical disabilities, you know, who have to dis disclose by nature. But I think where we've been the most helpful has been to really elucidate, you know, the capability of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the board. Um, probably the most common is ADHD and dyslexia in our population. Um, I would say the most desired by employers, by the way, just by, you um, just by uh, statistics um, are folks who are on the spectrum who have high technical skills. And so they're highly sought after. And so, you know, that's an easy placement. Someone who doesn't have those skills, um, different placement. And one last thing I'll say is what's true in the general population is true across the board for disability. And that is the more education you have, the better. And so if I have a high school degree, I do well. If I have 
a couple of years of post-secondary under my belt, that's even better. If I have a degree, that's better than that. And it's really no different. And in fact, I would say that since ADA, we have a lot of our, our population who has gone on to say, oh my God, it's going to be so great. You know, it's 30 years after ADA and look at all the things that have been promised to me. And they go off and they get, you know, graduate degrees and still no employment. So it's um it's an interesting time. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Joanna, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I think just the thought, just when I read that question, I think I had a thought, and maybe this is a clarifier in a second, but um, I think my question is why do we need to define them as different? I, I kind of think I have an idea, but I would be curious to know this individual, why you were curious about that. And that could be an aside, maybe you want to message me privately. Um, what I've experienced being a leader in our community, um, especially with our peer to peer, peer group called Creative Spirit Connect, where we really um, focus on supporting each other, um, adults that deserve independence um, within this community from a variety of different ways. Um, we do deal with classism, I guess I could call it. I don't have the right term within the disabilities community from a lot of different lenses. I struggle with that personally, because I do find that we lose the amount of numbers in a sense when we try and segregate ourselves again under the identity. Um, and something I spoke about this week actually at um, this conference that I've been at um, is there are so many unique combinations, we call them cocktail syndromes, of different labels. Um, coming together within one individual. And not only that, but let's say you have dyslexia, but you might have different strengths than another person with dyslexia. And, and this is why, in my opinion, getting tested, which is, which is a really interesting topic in terms of barriers, access, um, how much it costs, is it a positive or negative? There's a whole conversation around that as well. But for me, in my journey, quality, um, accommodations were not possible for me without getting a very good um, diagnosis. And that means I received a 40 page document that was not just copied and pasted from a million other folks previous before me, but I genuinely had, um, uh, I worked with an individual that was able to help me learn what those strengths really were based off of a series of tests. That is not accessible to everyone for a variety of reasons, and I'm aware of that privilege, and I'm grateful I had that opportunity. But one of the personal things I genuinely want to say is, for me, access to that needs to be more equitable. And that is something I will continue to work on for a long time, because without that information, um, answering that question, honestly, it, it's 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 a little more, um, it, it feels a little more nuanced. Than, than really that question encompasses. So I just will say, think about it more broadly because just because someone has dyslexia, they might have depression or PTSD that you might not know about, which might also count for someone being having struggles and barriers to employment um, that you might not get from just knowing the identity name. So I will say that I think it's a beautiful question and I'm glad it was asked, but I also will challenge you to think and explore broadly and investigate broadly more identities within the community to understand what that really means. Yeah, I see Steph's hand actually raised. Uh, Steph, would you like to um, clarify your question a little bit or respond? Hello, I would. Thank you, Joanna, so much for such a thorough answer. I do want to, um, briefly contextualize it and ask one follow on, but thank you already for the time on this question. Um, hello, I'm Stephanie. I use uh, she, her, and they, them pronouns, and I'm wearing a blue sweat zip up. Um, I uh, agree. Oh my gosh, totally. Um, when I initially asked the question, it was actually because we were being shown some slides and I actually wasn't, wasn't sure if um, some of the stats were around a certain population or whether it was on both. Um, 
uh, Joanna, you've made such important and good points um, about like how this is a very heterogeneous community and like assuming divisions does not serve that community necessarily. Um, but I now would like to ask you the follow up question of um, what was actually behind my question is that what I don't want is for people who are in places of relative privilege to actually be sort of taking up space um, and like dominating resources or um, like uh, wh whose voices are just being um, sort of like uh, louder um, and drowning out the voices of people who are more vulnerable. And so I wonder if you could just speak to a moment uh, uh, for a moment to the question of like how um, are the coalitions really like built and strengthened and leveraged for everyone's benefit, given that there are qualitatively different experiences um, between someone who only has dyslexia, so to speak, you know, uh, of course, there can be many other things that will go with that um, in our ableist world, but someone who has dyslexia and also has Down syndrome um, or something like that, where like, you know, these are different lived experiences, um, but there is, of course, a, a lot of um, common ground and um, many of the types of advocacy benefits um, uh, both of these populations. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for clarifying, Stephanie. Um, and I love this question. I think I love that you're asking it because it means you're really invested and in, in journeying down this process yourself. Um, I'm going to kind of answer this a little bit evasively only because I think this area is so new. I've reflected on this a lot being someone of privilege it's actually something i'm very insecure about and i struggle with that knowing if i should speak or not a lot of the time and i know laurel is my manager she knows these struggles are very personal um but what i have found comfort in um where we start does not mean that's where we're going to end in terms of disclosure. So what I mean is what's palpable now to disclose might be different in a few years to what's palpable to see the whole truth. So just because I disclose that I'm ADHD and dyslexic, there might be some other things I'm not comfortable disclosing. So I'll say that for my own personal journey, but I have also experienced that with folks um, in other intersectional pieces um, whether it be race, gender, sexuality, um, uh, am I forgetting something? There's a million. I could think of a million ways because in humans are very innately complex in their identities. So there's there's only so many ways we can make this bite size to start out with. And I think this is why I always say this: there is no competition in this space because if we start saying there's competition in DE and I, we forget to include those that are underrepresented already and we elevate those and create another gap um, within the space so for me um, this is a start but there's a long way to go and i think it comes from creating safe spaces that we are pulling more people up into from those communities um, that's something i personally want to do every time i'm given the opportunity and i know both the ladies on this call have done that and um, and have advocated for that within their own teams um, and i think there's gonna have to be a heck of a lot more of it from every type of industry every type of section of an organization entry level all the way up to c-suite um, and i think one of the pieces of advice which might be interesting to reiterate here that I learned this week is what makes a good leader is someone that listens down and speaks up, right? So we need more people with disabilities in those roles and moving up the ladder um, in order to get more folks that are within those more um, protected categories where they need to be, which it should be equitable for all to have fair wage. I know we've been talking about this for a bit. I, I wanted to just add a little twist that may take us in a little, a slightly different direction. But one of the reasons that we stayed focused on and stay focused on employment is because no matter what amount of money, privilege, where you come from, what have you, there is no, I mean, unless you're Elon Musk or somebody else with a billion dollars, it is very, very expensive to support a family around that has a member with dis a member and sometimes more than one member with a disability. It is draining. Um, one of our financial partners, Voya, 
um, focuses on uh, retirement for everybody. And that means educating families with people with disabilities in it because they end up completely mortgaging their um, retirement savings to support their families with disabilities. And so this starts very early, you know, when you have um, a, a child early on and it just gets more and more expensive and it drains the entire, you have more families in poverty who have people with disabilities in their family than any other population in the country. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steph, for your question. And thank you, Laura, for Joanna and Joanna for that. Um, we'll move on to uh, talking more about organizations and, and what organizations can do uh, to support, to actively recruit um, and support um, individuals uh, with disabilities. Um, so maybe we can start with Andrea for this. Um, once an organization realizes how important it is to um, actively recruit differently abled people, uh, where can they start? Yeah, so I think some of this um, is a part of it's interesting. My role as a chief marketing officer has changed over time as we've tried to look at how are we building a culture that's really strong. And I end up, uh, you know, kind of reaching across the the table to both my chief diversity officer and my and the the head of HR as well. And so I think um, a lot of what we've done is starting with education. Um, and then quickly trying to progress into partnering with organizations like Creative Spirit or others, depending on the different populations that we're looking at, in, in trying to better understand how we can have more better preparedness in our own organization to be able to understand the talent um, set that we need. Um, and then how to match that with others outside. And so that um, tends to start with a bit of an assessment. Um, so that that um, that we can be the best employer, if you will, that we can find the right matches, and then we can go through a bit of a training process so that we make sure that we have identified uh, the home base for the candidate um, and that we're highly focused on the long term. So, you know, Laurel mentioned that there are many ways of of hiring um, so that, you know, it could be strictly an internship, a fellowship, but our goal is to really find um, long-term employment so that we can really change the trajectory that we just talked about um, so that we don't see continued economic, um, you know, disasters, frankly, for, for, for generations to come. Um, I think the other thing is that the the more that we've got that long term commitment, you see that incredible um, benefit both to the company as well as to the candidate that has joined. And so one of the most beautiful stories that Laurel might may remember this moment when I was um, I was at an event um, talking to one of the candidates who I almost will cry. He, he told me that he never imagined that he would get a job and that it would be his dream job. And the whole idea that, you know, I could have a son or a daughter um, that's not overlooked, but for some reason he was, and to hear about the contributions from his employer and to hear the joy, um, you know, that he has from going to work each and every day. And he spreads that everywhere he goes, inside his organization, outside his organization. And he's been there for many years. And the, you know, the the organization is now stronger for it. He's stronger for it. The stories are stronger. And we're changing the trajectory, not only for him, uh, but his family and for others that, you know, that have the benefit of hearing his story. So I think that's really the goal is to be thinking not just about a bolt-on solution, but rather how do we, um, I don't like to use the word operationalize, but it's, you know, how do we more systemically um, look at creating programs for the long term? Yeah. Can you share more about what those programs may look like in terms of once an organization has um, sort of sort of actively sort of recruiting, uh, how can they actively work to support the retention and um, inclusivity of uh, employees with um, disabilities? Laurel, maybe you want to take that one. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, a couple things. One, um, we feel like having a coach in the workplace is a really important piece of the puzzle. 
Um, and we, we start out in the beginning saying, oh, well, we'll give everybody a coach and they'll come in and they'll do onboarding and they'll stay with the person for a month. And it was way too much. So just to give you a sense of the kind of coaching I'm talking about, you're talking about the kind of professional coaching that we all love to have in the workplace and that our coaches end up working as closely with the hiring managers as they do with the candidates themselves. And we find that, you know, a, a light meeting every three weeks or so as a check-in works out supremely well. There are times when people are really digging in, um, but by and large, um, that kind of support in the workplace is really important. The other thing is we learn this over time, you know, after this, uh, right after the study, we put a, an important uh, set of training in the marketplace. And we do this cohort training where we, we train people 15 uh, leaders at a time inside of a corporation. The corporation picks the cohort. We don't pick it. So it could be your know, HR team, or it could be a cross organizational team, an ERG, whatever the case may be. And then they become the trainers for the rest of the organization. And that kind of training is um, incredibly powerful because think about it, your employees know that wow, this is something not only that I learned, but I can take back into the community with me. And we find that that sort of uh, amplifies inside of their school communities and their home communities as well. Yeah, thank you. I really like that um, concept of training the trainers and just having them be the ones that are also, um, yeah, with the knowledge and resources to, to continue creating that. I mean, people training. don't know what they don't know. And I yeah. think that's the one thing we all have to respect. It was great to do the study. And it was sad to have to, you know, bump up against all of those myths. And the one around training was probably the one that was the easiest to embrace because it made us empathetic. It makes everybody empathetic with those trying to do good inside their organizations, for sure. And we learned that a little education goes a long way. Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of working with candidates, um, I'll maybe start with Joanna for this. <clears throat> Uh, what are some common comments that you receive from differently abled individuals who have found a job uh, that they love thanks to creative spirit? And is there a common experience that they share with you? Oh, wow. Well, I think Andrea briefly mentioned one of our candidates. He's incredible and a good friend. He was part of the original cohort with me. Um, one of the things he says is he never thought he would get a job at this level, um, nor you know a job in general. And, um, and have it be his dream job, which he never knew he could dream of. <laughs> there are folks that I think say, you know, with Creative Spirit's help, I was able to navigate, you know, the politics within an organization that I could never do without without the support of Creative Spirit. And they learned what not to say and what to say. Sometimes that's very simple, you know, just, um, you know, having a mentor internally and, and a coach that really helps. So that's something we've heard a lot of. Um, and then I can also say, I think just having access to people that are continuously trying to understand you as an individual when it is challenging or there's something going on where you're stressed or anxious, which is I think often what we talk a lot about is reducing the anxiety for each individual is probably the biggest part of the process. But in turn, it creates a ripple effect throughout your teams and your corporations where the anxiety is reduced overall just by basic habits. Um, and so I will say that I think managers um, that have worked with our candidates would also say that, you know, they've taught us some things um, in terms of productivity, in terms of technology that they use, in terms of, you know, meditation, for example, like habits that they have that they bring into the workforce. Um, that change and and make things acceptable for others that um that they might you might never have thought of before yeah yeah thank you so much anything else laura and andrea that you want to add well i think um you know i think there's some real opportunity to be able to bring together you know, a lot of thinking in one place. And I don't think that we alone will solve that. But as more and more companies jump on board, we've been able to generalize a lot of that learning. And I think that that's something that, you know, if, you know, th those of you who have joined this call are interested in, you know, we are going to do a day of learning very soon. And I think this idea of generalizing information is super important. I'm looking at some of the chat conversations too, and a lot of them are really around education, you know, 
How do you protect someone who says they have ADHD? How do you prove that they have, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, thank you. There are a lot of great questions in the chat and I wanna make sure we get to them. So I'm actually gonna transition us to um, questions from our audience. Um, I'll start with this one first. I'm a parent of a child with epilepsy, ADHD, dyslexia, who's experiencing internalized stigma, years of IEPs and feeling different. We are providing him with mental health and school support. Are there programs or employers that support parents in concrete ways, such as offering opportunities for young people to be exposed to different careers before they are at age of looking for work? Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a formal process around transition. Um, and I think that, it, and that is federally regulated, uh, federally mandated now. Um, and I think that if you are in a school district that is actively putting inclusion into place or into practice, um, and all the other students are having the same experience, which is always the nicest part, but the time you get to transition, and transition happens at 14, by the way, it doesn't happen at whatever, whatever age you are as a senior, um, but it happens at uh, the year you go from being 13 to 14. And I think that's the place where we hope we can start to move upstream and start to impact a younger and younger population. Right now we're focused on you know, getting jobs for folks who are in the marketplace because there are so many, but ultimately we, what we hope to do is to educate at the middle school and high school level in terms of that. But you, you should seek out the transition coordinator in your district for sure. They, they, it is mandated by law. Thank you, Laurel. And uh, Andrea and Joanna, feel free to add um, if there's anything. I would just say that we've done, we've been able to convene a lot of people from different industries um, and who play different roles across organizations. Um, so that we can have open dialogues and they're, they're you know, safe places to ask questions and to be able to share information. Um, and I know that a lot of our partners have found that to be very helpful to hear a combination of, you know, results from surveys, what's worked, what hasn't, personal stories, um, hear from the candidates uh, themselves and their families, in addition to those in government and, you know, places of employment. And so we we continue to convene audiences. I know one of the sessions that we hosted at the New York Stock Exchange was um, of huge benefit to our chief diversity officer who had recently joined. Um, and she frankly felt embarrassed by the fact that she had, you know, had sort of overlooked um or, or had sort of thought of diversity in a very specific way when she had joined and having a safe place and being able to meet other colleagues and things like that, just help help to open things up um, and to provide pragmatic ideas so that people could take sometimes the first step, sometimes the second or third, but to know that we're all learning and growing together. So we appreciate this because this is exactly one of those forums. And now that you're a part of our uh, friends and family network, we'd love to include you in all kinds of ways that you could perhaps um, join our community as well. Yeah, and I see Joanna dropped a link in the chat. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think one of the main pieces of quote unquote legal advice I could give is to really understand your disability to the extent that you can. Right. If you can't afford to get a combination, which I mentioned before, it's a complicated process, whether it's exclusion or a barrier for financial reasons or uh, quality of uh, uh, what would it be called diagnosis, you know, not having someone that really gives you a quality diagnosis with details um, that are unique to your own experience. Um, outside of those two things, I think you can do research on the JAN network. Um, that has been an incredible, I only found out about it, Laurel, I would say you, you educated me on this maybe three years ago, and it is probably the most used resource I, I recommend to folks who think they may have a disability or have provided accommodations um, because they've, they have a piece of paper that says they have it, um, regardless of the quality, just the, the paper um, that gets you the first step, right? Um, or electronic, whatever they do these days. <laughs> but they, I will say that 
going through that um, site and reading as much as you can on that that diagnosis or or about the community learning about your disability rights is really important understanding the history of disability rights is really important um i we personally put a lot of stuff on our blog from our communications team at creative spirit that educates our folks um, and the outside world in general on the history of the disability rights movement which shares a lot a lot of interesting information that isn't ever, I never received an education on disability rights in once in my entire educational career track um, and schooling. So I would say, unfortunately, these are not mainstream topics. And unfortunately, we have to centralize the information better. But I would say starting with the JAN is a really great place and it's very um, uh, strong and credited. Um, as a way to sort of kickstart your own investigations. Yeah, thank you, Joanna, for sharing that resource. Um, the next question from our audience is, from a legal standpoint, people with cognitive disabilities like ADHD are only loosely protected under the law and can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Companies can push the issue and say that they're not protected unless they have documentation that says their ADHD significantly affects their ability to do the job. However, then companies can claim that they can not do the job and not hire them or pay them less. How would you navigate this issue? I think the pay equity piece is probably, you know, clear on its face in terms of, you know, obviously pay equity issues are legally protected. I think the more complex issue is how do I prove well, first of all, you have the myth around ADHD that it's not a significant disability, right? So just by happenstance, you know, everybody sort of walks into that situation saying, should I disclose because my employer is going to discriminate against me? Um, I think that there's sufficient evidence now and there's sufficient information in the marketplace that um, has sort of validated that people with ADHD not only are um, not... Um, making it up, but they're also um, highly qualified candidates for certain positions. And so one of the things we've been doing is using, and we don't ask for medical diagnosis unless you offer it up, but we know from your characteristics, let's say it, it appears like ADHD or you have those qualities, th that qualifies you or that makes you a great candidate for certain jobs. And so I think part of the problem is people with disabilities tend to settle for jobs that really aren't their passion. They're really not in their, you know, strike zone. They're not what they want to do. You know, and that gets to a whole nother, you know, set of discussions around, you know, what are you truly, what are we truly teaching people when we say, you know, that job is good enough, sub-minimum wage is good enough. And so I'd say, go for your passion, um, disclose. And I'd say any employer who wants to discriminate on the basis probably isn't the right one. And I would look to uh, like our website where you can put in your qualifications and then get matched with a job that's more like um, the one that you would probably excel at. And we've had really, really super great retention with our candidates. That's it's almost 100 percent. So um, over the you know five years. So I feel and not everybody's been in their job for five years. I'm just saying over the five years. Um, but. Um, we're super proud of that. And we think it's the combination of this sort of openness and transparency um, and picking the right employers who are willing to do that as well. Yeah, thank you so much. The next question is for Joanna specifically. Joanna, you mentioned professional ways to disclose and request accommodations. Can you expand on that and provide some tips for people who may be asking themselves these questions? Um, can we clarify at what stage of their process they're at maybe with their disability? Because I think it's very unique. Like if you are at the stage where you're still learning and researching about your disability, you're going to act a different way necessarily than someone who, let's say, has an arsenal of information, their accommodations are straight, um, straightened out, and they have you know, access to them to provide them. You know, it, it's a little different for each person. I, I guess, do you want me to be general or <laughs> more specific? Is there a specific situation that that individual is curious about is what I'm asking? Yeah, I'm not seeing it in the chat. Okay. Um, so maybe you can start general and then if the person, you know, responds. Then Feels comfortable. Like yeah, and it, yeah. feel free. If or if not, no to... Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. 
Um, yeah, if anyone wants to directly message me on LinkedIn ever, please feel free. Um, I usually am pretty good at responding there. Um, I will just say that, um, look, start from the fact, and this is maybe a little new age or modern way of thinking about interviewing, but when you're interviewing, you have every right to interview your interviewer to see if that corporation is the right fit for you. And when in regards to looking for the right place for you with your disability, um, I know we try to put our best foot forward in an interview and we kind of want to like maybe make ourselves look the best we possibly can. And this might not top of mind think as um, the best thing to share right off the bat. But honestly, I will say if you conquer that fear of rejection and you tell them, you know, where what you are, if you identify in that discussion and you you listen to how they react in that you question them back and say, how does that make you feel? Would that be supported in the culture of my company or the company that you're interviewing for? Um, I think that'll tell you a lot. You'll be able to discern, are there others that have disclosed? Do they even have a formalized process of accommodations yet? Um, do they care? what I just said, do they have any experience personally, what I just said, do you have a connection? Once that discussion gets started, if there is a discussion that ensues after that discuss, you know, after that disclosure. Um, I'm not saying that's easy. And I'm not saying it's going to happen in your first interview after this conversation today on April 26th. <laughs> but I am saying that that's a really, really great way to start figuring out what cultures are right for you. And even if you love that organization, um, another thing I could say is if there's an organization that you dream about working with and you're afraid that it's not gonna be the right fit for you because of your disability, why don't you consider coming and talking to us at Creative Spirit and working with our coaches to come up with a strategy that is specific for your goals professionally? Because I think that's something we do really well is working with you directly on your dreams and your goals professionally and helping you reach them, whether it be strategizing, whether it be helping you get that first inter internship that will get you to that next step, that will get you to the next step, that will get you there. Um, I think if you know where you wanna work and you bring it to your conversations with our candidates or um, our candidate coaches, um, that collaborative process will be a lot more beneficial to you in the long run and you'll see a lot more success in those, in those interviews. I just wanted to add that I think that um, real quick, that um, if you're already in an organization, you're really trying to make some of those decisions, you know, a little bit different than, you know, when you come in and being hired, I think Joanna covered that pretty broadly. I think the, the notion of being the person who inquires about starting an ERG, um, about starting a small group and watching it grow is tremendous because it gets leadership attention, number one. And number two, it also um, has been noted as being highly successful inside of organizations. I think I mentioned Boya before, but, you know, having everybody retire um, successfully as part of their mission, but they made disability a centerpiece because they started an ERG and that ERG now has 3,000 people in it. It's almost astounding when you think about it, right? I mean, maybe it's part of their business strategy. That's great. But I don't know many ERGs that have 3,000 people in it in a relatively small organization. I mean, they're not, you know, they're not Apple. They're not Google. They're, I don't know how many thousands of employees have gotten forgotten, but they've done a fabulous job of evangelizing. Yeah. Thank you, Joanna and Laurel. Um, and because this question is coming from a fellow Gladstonian, I would say starting with the people services team um, here at Gladstone would be a really great place to start. Um, and, you know, we can kind of ask questions and, and kind of direct you to the right resources for sure. Yeah, I was going to, um, oh, yeah. sorry, I was just going to say, if you're not at Gladstone's or if you, if you know someone that is in the disabilities community and they're in another organization from Gladstone's, um, advice that you could provide is definitely to speak to their HR departments and ERGs stand for employee resource groups, which I didn't know of until I got into this industry. But if you bring it to them and say, um, we have a conglomerate of folks. So asking, you know, if you have a few folks, it's a little bit easier, um, bringing that group to the HR departments in your organization and saying, we'd love to, to start a, a formalized group here and, and start discussing this. Thank you. 
Um, this last question from the audience is from Laurel. Uh, what were the demographics of the 153 respondents in the study? And did you conduct surveys with individuals living with learning disabilities on how they perceive, experience job professional lives? Yeah, I was just going to bring up the study to remind myself, but um, you, I put the study in the chat and the demographics are in there. Um, I believe it was an equal split um, of senior managers, so SVP and above, but the criteria was around having to be a hiring decision maker. And so it, you didn't need to necessarily be the highest and SVP or above to do that, but you had to have something to do with a hiring decision and that you could ultimately be someone who um, would be involved in um, DEI discussion. So that was the study. In terms of, you know, you, I think you guys just gave us like a great idea. We should probably be doing a study among individuals where we can start to capture some of the success stories and also, you know, some of the trials and tribulations and the experiences, both qualitatively and quantitatively. We talk to literally thousands of candidates on an ongoing basis um, and have probably cataloged their experiences um, over the past few years. And maybe that's something we should dive into. I, we do have a battery um, that uh, uh, on the candidate side that uh, reflects who are the, how, how um, it's how we build our, our learning algorithm for the job matching. But we do understand um, people's experiences in their jobs. So we know that if you've had more than six jobs and you're, you know, probably 30 years old, we don't know how old you are, but how, if you're 30 years old, um, that that's going to have, that's going to be a very different experience than somebody who's getting their first job out of school or somebody who's been successfully in a job for a long period of time, you can imagine. So I think we're going to collect some of that information now that you guys have brought that up. I think that'd be super. Maybe you could help us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'll go back to an earlier question um, that we had prepared, and this one, um, Andrea, if you want to start, uh, for some hiring managers, it might not be easy to know how to evaluate candidate uh, with disability or to um, compare them to other candidates. What are some tips that you can give um, to hiring managers? Yeah, so I think a part of this, um, the training that we'll provide will give you know everyone more of a sense of that, but I think one of the beauties of Creative Spirit is that we can almost reverse engineer the appropriate fit um, and have people shadow us in the process so that the the um, all of the learnings become more institutionalized going forward and you build that sort of capability and mindset. Um, but I think that uh, you know to to take that first step, um, it's generally much easier to after the the first assessment, um, once you're going into the matchmaking phase to actually have us, be helpful in in providing, um, you know, kind of that early on experience. Yeah, thank you, Joanna and Laura. Anything to add there? No, I think um, I think generally speaking, the the most important thing I I feel like we're doing and thinking about right now is how do we bring companies together who've had these experiences. That makes any sense, and yeah. you know, when we do our day of learning, it'll be interesting to see when when we're not we're, we may be um, the catalyst, but hearing what people's shared experiences are, and I think that's going to be a tremendous. You know, stay tuned for some information about what we learned coming from that um, in June. Yeah, thank you. Or join us. <laughs> yeah, definitely, we'll be sure to to share that out to our audience. Julie, you have a question. Hi, yeah, thanks, Lynn. Um, thanks, Laurel, John, and Andrea for being here. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting you in advance of this, and I shared this with you, um, but I just wanted to bring it here today. Um, it struck me as we were um, sort of putting together this event, um, I was reminded by a former speaker who, um, at a Critical Conversations event, and he, uh, his name was Manu Platt. He was a Black professor at Georgia, at Georgia Tech, and um, he's really into uh, sort of shedding light on racial inequities in STEM. And he shared it with us a story that um, a few years prior, a uh, program director had asked him why he wasn't hiring more students with disabilities in his lab. And he'd said things like, I don't know where to find them. And what if they make everyone else in the lab uncomfortable? And you know, how do I know they'll be able to do the work? And as he was saying those things, it occurred to him that these are the same questions people used to ask about women and Black students and how mad he would be if people we're saying things like that about black students today and it really shifted his um, approach and I just wondered what you thought about this and 
if you think sort of those age old myths and, and this kind of perspective may be related to why so many DEI strategies do include gender and sort of racial diversity, but um, so few unfortunately include um, people with disabilities. Yeah, I mean, I think this is um, a much less mature topic. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, people were institutionalized less than 40 years ago. ADA has only existed for 30 years. I think we've been talking about race and gender for a little bit longer than that. Um, so it's, you know, that much more mature. But on the other hand, um, you have to scratch your head and, and, you know, say, you know, why would we paint a broad picture like that of one population over another? And I think that's the, I think, I think it's, I think the tenor is starting to change. I know uh, where my daughter goes to school at Syracuse, when they teach education, if you want to be an education major, they only teach inclusive education. So that means you're learning everything from critical race theory to how to include people with disabilities in the workplace, et cetera. And so there's no such thing as education that is just straight up, I'm going to educate a generalized homogenous population. I think until that generate this generation matures, you know, we're kind of stuck with the the mores that we have. And, and the more we all speak out in broad generalities about the inequity, pay inequity, job inequity, you know, all the things we've been talking about today, you know, it's not going to change for this generation. And and this is I'm probably the most disheartened about the kids that are, you know, young adults right now, because again, they grew up with ADA with an expectation that their life was going to be different. And we sort of trick them and pull the rug out from under them. And I'm very hopeful that the next generation will be in a little bit better place because they have all of us, right, educating and as parents, and hopefully we're very broad-minded about it. Um, so what I would say to him is, you know, treat it with a little bit of grace and simply say, you know, join in. And let's paint this with a broad brush and say everybody has an everybody should have an opportunity here. I would just add one, uh, yeah. one other thing that I can say personally from uh, Vayner's standpoint is that the employees have a big voice in our organization and leadership listens to them. And it wasn't until we uh, we actually um, helped a group of 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 people form what we call they abilities. So Vayner, um, people that are differently abled uh, to come together and form what Joanna just talked about, an employee resource group um, that we started to pay more attention. We started to become more educated um, and that we knew we had to take steps. Um, but some of it's difficult to Joanna's point about disclosure and there's there can be all kinds of personal things that have to go on. And so part of this is creating an environment within a corporation or, or an organization that is a safe place for people to show up as they are and to be able to pave the way uh, for you know continued change. I think in general, most um, corporations do have good intentions. I think that most would be horrified by the statistics that we've just shared today um, and would want to become, you know, change from the 85% unemployment, the 12% corporations that um, that are hiring, um, but then the million jobs that we have an ambition to create. And so, you know, it's going to take a lot to get there. But I think if anything, one thing that we learned during the pandemic is that um, employees do have rights and they do have a voice and um, they do hold corporations responsible and accountable um, and they have choices. Um, and so I think the more that employees can can be a part and that leadership um, can do the right thing, that's where, when we're going to start to make more change. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just quickly going to add to the end of that, and this is a story that Laurel says a lot, but we were both at the this lunch and learn one of the first years that I started um, being an ambassador for Creative Spirit um, at one of our partner organizations that we still continue uh, a relationship with, and they're an incredible um, organization that we spotlight a lot. Um, and in that conversation, that lunch and learn where we had, let's say, 20 to 25 folks sitting in a conference room in their offices, um, and we were going through a presentation around, um, I believe we we're educating on Autism Awareness Month, so it was in April around this time. Um, and we asked, Laurel actually astutely asked at the end of the conversation, um, you know, by a show of hands, just a brief survey, why did you 
choose to attend today's meeting. And it was basically split down the middle. Laurel, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, about half the people said they either knew someone with a disability or they were themselves someone with a disability or they had a sibling or, a, you know, somehow connected in their network to someone with a disability. The other half of the organization was predominantly young folks or entry level folks or, you know, medium level folks um, who said they wanted to be at an organization that prioritized disability and folks with disabilities um, in their belief systems as corporations. So this just points out the importance that new employees, regardless if they have a disability or an association with someone with a disability, there is an interest for this across the board. Um, and it is, I believe, something that the future of work needs to take seriously because it's it's something we care about when we actually understand it better. Yeah, thank you, Joanna. Thanks, Julie, for that really great question. Um, perhaps, unless there are any more q and A, I I will uh, wrap up with this final question uh, for all of our participants. Creative Spirit has defined success as making the hiring and retention of those with disabilities a common part of every organization's hiring practice. What do you see as the main barriers to reaching that goal? I would, I would challenge the audience with that question to some degree too, because I'd love to hear the answer. I mean, I really do think it's education. I think that, you know, we've had employer organizations jump on board um, after one session. And, and I noticed I started with employer organizations as one of the biggest barriers, right? Like we're putting the onus on the employers because, and the reason we focused on large organizations to begin with is that's where all the jobs are in this country. That's where all the training and globally, by the way. So if you're a company with 2,500 employees or more, as an example, not minimizing small companies, but you have training programs, you have resources, you have a desire to do these kinds of programs. And so I think the biggest barrier is, you know, can we get 100% of the companies on board? Um, it may be law, but nobody's enforcing it. And I think the other barrier is we've got to get back to Washington and have this conversation in a broader way. I mean, there is a quota, by the way. You're supposed to hire 7% of people with dis disabilities and, and um, intellectual disabilities in particular into your organization. It's completely not enforced. So um, rather than go in that direction, I'd say appealing to these you know, very generous employers who um, have an interest in that area, education is the biggest barrier. I would just ladder on and say that, you know, education with a fast follow of commitment, because we're not, if we just lean back um, and get educated, uh, as Laurel pointed to, I think we're trying to get to the root cause, but at the same time, we need to start making progress today. It's, um, you know, we, we, we can't live with the statistics that we've talked about. And if we all grab the arms of um, those that are inside our organization and one or two outside, um, so that we can create more momentum. Um, that's that's when we're going to start to see the change in addition to going to the government. But I think all of us know that there is a great deal of uh, of power and um, responsibility, frankly, in, in corporate America. And we can't wait for the government any longer. We have to do something today. Yeah, I would I would add on to that. I would say um, from a candidate's perspective or a person with a disability, I would say isolation is probably the biggest barrier for us. Um, we are often isolated either because of the society itself or the characteristics of a corporate culture, um, our own personal experiences. So I guess my one piece of advice to this group of people, if I can, you know, advocate for you guys to kind of get involved is, if you know someone with a disability, please be there for them. Ask how they're doing. Um, listen, just listen. I mean, literally like start the question and then sit back. Um, and sometimes there's an awkward silence and that's okay. Sit through the awkward silence and wait till that person speaks. Um, I think listening is something we need to get better at as, an or as a society in general, especially because it's so fast paced, but sometimes it just takes slowing down literally letting an awkward silence go a little longer and you'll hear some incredible stories um, and it won't take too long to become friends. I mean, I think most folks with disabilities struggle with mobility challenges or 
we're introverted or there are certain societal cues we don't understand. But if you can be our rocks in the stream of stuff that's going on in, uh, in our own lives, um, the kindness that you can share to others, um, the empathy that you can share to others, that really goes a long way with this community. Thank you so much, um, Andrea, Joanna, and Laura for all of your um, just insights today and for being here to talk with Gladstone about um, supporting individuals with disabilities. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming out today and participating in all of your questions. Um, we hope that this um, event encourages even more discussion and actions as well. And so we'll be sure to send out some of the resources that our wonderful panelists mentioned today. Um, and then finally, a video of this uh, discussion will be uploaded on Gladstone's YouTube channel shortly. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.